a St Andrews night Cayley near Bankery. What could be more Scottish? But yet again, things are not quite what they seem. Oh, we saw a team come up from England and dance in Aberdeen. And we thought, gosh, that looks great fun. So we thought we'd give it a try. But once you get hooked on Morris dancing, you tend to be a Morris man forever, more or less. You sort of die in post, you know. Um, so it's, uh, it's a bit addictive, though quite why, I don't think any of us really know. It's um, quite an interesting phenomenon. Most people think of Morris dancing as quintessentially English, but in the confused story of identity, it actually has deep Scottish roots. Morris dancing was first recorded in the UK in Scotland in 1472, I think, or thereabouts, maybe plus or minus a year or two. And it started off as a courtly entertainment in the, in the, in the court of the king, gradually went down the social, social ladder until it became a sort of um, country village sort of thing. Um, and so we regard it as an old Scottish tradition which we're reviving. Now, although it's not usually perceived that way because most people think it's English, but it's not at all. So Scottish Morris dancing revived. It's a local hybrid that resists any attempts to classify or confine cultural identity. It's simply what these men have made for themselves. You know, we have quite a strong identity. I mean, we've been dancing together for nearly 40 years. Almost forever. Almost forever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we have quite a strong identity as well. We have our own dances with our own characteristic steps yeah. and movements. And even if and we, we do... feel very... We, we have a strong local... Um, yeah. And local even if we tradition. do other people's dances, we're still adapting them for our, our, what we feel is comfortable. So there's definitely a localness about it. We've built a local tradition over 40 years. Is that, I don't know why that's any help. <laughs> the referendum is already emotionally charged and no community will go unnoticed in the search for votes. But I'm keeping my eye on Scotland's most fragmented identities to see if they have any influence at all on the referendum. My favourite so far is Scottish drag queens for independence. Be true to yourself in life, politics and love. They may not hold the balance of power, but the beehives are brilliant. In an opulent corner of Belgravia that is forever Scotland, I met up with Scottish emigre Hugo Rifkind. When you come across the debates about the independence referendum in Scotland, what are your immediate emotional feelings about it rather than kind of rational political feelings? What emotionally do you feel? In a strange way, I feel two things at once. Uh, partly I feel, um, I feel a bit like I've got no place commenting because if I wanted to have, I feel like I ought to feel as if I wanted to have a say in Scotland's future, uh, I should have stayed in Scotland. And the fact that I didn't, I feel like I've slightly sacrificed that. So I find it hard to get too angry about the fact that I don't have a vote, for example. Mm. But at the same time, I'm, there's a sort of fear and a resentment. I feel like it threatens to take something away from me. It threatens to make me a, make me a foreigner in, in what, where I now live. You know, I mean, I consider my experience living in London, you know, having made a home in London, I don't feel like some sort of, you know, Aravista kind of Irishman or Australian. You know, this is, this is mine. This is my country. I've merely moved. And that goes further than 
ideas of citizenship or passports because under the white paper, the Scottish government's white paper, you would hold Scottish citizenship through a number of different definitions of that. I would hold Scottish citizenship, absolutely, but I would become a, a different nationality for my daughters, for example. Or at least not, not quite a different nationality, but I would... Um, I mean, I, I don't, don't quite know how else to say it, except for, you know, this is, this is mine. I come to London, it's mine. It's the, it's the capital of my country. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the country that my ancestors moved to. And to be told that actually my ancestors didn't move to that country, but they moved to a different country, and it's me, I'm the immigrant, um, is, um, it's not really how my, um, my identity works. I confess that my own identity has a homing instinct. This is where I grew up. It's a million miles from Belgravia and the sense of Britishness that Hugo Rifkin feels is under threat. To me, this is home. This is the back streets of Letham in Perth where I grew up, a typical working class housing scheme. And over the years, it was a place that people aspired to live in. My mother and father came here. He had been an Irish Scot, she was English, and they met during the war. The war for them was clearly something that mattered. It brought them together with a purpose, uh, the idea of Britishness. But as I grew up and got older, I began to realise that Britishness didn't matter quite so much to me and to my generation. In lots of ways, Britishness seemed as if it was in decline. This film captures the flickering images of the Empire Exhibition in Glasgow in 1938. It talks of the Scots as North Britons, bound by an umbilical cord to industry, empire and war. Today they are the same race of whom, nearly 500 years ago, the historian Hollinshed spoke. They are unto we find them to be courageous and hardy, offering themselves often unto the uttermost perils with great assurance, so that a man may pronounce nothing to be over hard or pass their power to perform. I'll leave my regiment last night. Although it's dead and gone for me, this feeling of Britishness is not a thing of the past for others. <laughs> Here at Stirling Mart, the cattle could be sold as best of British or Scotch beef. And many of their owners admit to a dual identity that's a bit of both. I would say Scottish and British. But is it Scottish first and then British? Oh yeah, well, I'm, I live in Scotland, so I'm, I'm a Scot. But I'm, I am British. Being British is... I said, well, the, the only reason I'm British is because my passport says I'm British. I'm quite pleased to be part of the Union, whilst at the same time uh, I love my country. Um, very much see myself as Scottish, but I do indeed see myself as British as well. So Britishness is real and palpable for some, and my rush to confine it to the past is not universally shared. Some are deeply committed to keeping Britishness in their everyday lives. Whether Scotland goes independent or not, I would like to retain a cultural sense of Britishness and not, not in the, not in the old-fashioned style of the Empire and, you know, the British Bulldog and the St George's flag. I mean, you know, like I mentioned in, in terms of, like, like, for example, I'll give you a good example of this. I feel very much at home in Manchester and Liverpool and actually Birmingham. These are towns that I feel at home in and I, I find, especially in Manchester, actually, it's almost like another Glasgow to me. It feels very similar. I don't have the same feeling when I go to London and I know that when a lot of Scottish people say they hate the English, they don't. They don't hate the English. They hate the South East is what they hate. They don't hate the English. And interestingly, London is kind of almost hiving away as its own entity anyway. Um, so I, I would not like to lose links with towns like Manchester and Liverpool because I feel quite, quite strongly, you know, there's an argument actually that you could rebuild Hadrian's Wall, you know, maybe around about, I don't know, Leamington Spa, somewhere around about there. Um, I don't want Coventry, I'm not bothered. This is about the loose ends, ties that bind the disparate threads together. 
800,000 people born in Scotland live in the rest of the UK and are border hoppers. Vast numbers of my friends have worked for a time in England, some have settled in England and gone back. Um, my peer group is, is border hopping, you know, and um, it feels a bit like an independent Scotland would, would, would deny me that identity, would, would tell me that I had to make a choice about what I was, about whether I, whether I was a, 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 a Scot in England or whether I ought to, you know, I don't know, pass the Tebbit test and, and yeah. become an Englishman in England, <laughs> which, which is not something I have any, desi any desire, desire to, to do. do. Yeah. Evidence suggests that coexisting feelings and dual identities of both Scottishness and Britishness provide an important battleground in the referendum. Because in a sense virtually everybody in Scotland feels strongly Scottish, but Scotland clearly at the moment is a nation which is divided about the merits of independence, it follows that there must be a lot of people who have a strong sense of Scottish identity who at the moment are not following that up. They are saying to themselves, Look, it isn't just about whether or not I feel Scottish and I want my country to become an independent state. It's also about that I also feel British, I feel some affinity with the rest of the UK, and do I want to let that go? And I think probably uh, the yes side to be able to win this referendum, actually one of their key tasks is to persuade people who have at least a modest sense of British identity, you can afford to let it go. I started by saying there are over five million ways of being a Scot, but one recurring pattern in the diverse quilt of identity is that sense of Britishness that still exerts influence. So here's the paradox. I set off on a journey to discover the many different versions of Scottishness and on the way discovered the concentric circles of identity and a thread of Britishness that runs through it. It's faded for some, disappeared for others, but for other people it's very much alive and that may well shape the outcome of the referendum. But one thing is absolutely certain. Scotland's population is rising for the very first time in centuries and that may take us on a very big journey indeed to six million different versions of being Scottish. Yeah.